Hi, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Caitlin Bigsby, Head of Product Marketing for Virtualytics, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Young Kim, who is Head of Solutions Consulting for Virtualytics. Virtualytics uses AI to lead you to your data, to find that data um, insight and that you need to make transformative, transparent enterprise AI. And today we're going to be talking about breaking the limits of data exploration and really amplifying the impact that your functions can have on your entire enterprise, whether it's from analytics or through to AI. We're going to talk about the restrictions of hypothesis-led exploration and what that imposes, the limits that that imposes on your projects and the risks it introduces. We're going to talk about the opportunities of using out-of-the-box AI-led exploration to actually explore and create a solid foundation for the work that you're doing. And finally, that missing piece, how you actually visualize all this information to really discover the meaning behind it. So let's start with the restrictions. At most organizations, uh, an analytics or AI project begins when somebody in the business observes a challenge or potentially an, an opportunity to do something different. They generally have an idea of what they think is behind it, where they should be focusing their attention. Uh, before this challenge can be brought to the data science teams to really refine and put into production, uh, you need to do a little bit of baseline exploration and really explore the problem, uh, usually by a business analyst. So this challenge and the hypothesis is brought forward to the business analyst. Uh, so example, perhaps uh, there's been a problem observed in the warehouse, you're getting parts just a little later than you need it. So it looks like you have a problem on the supply chain. So this is the challenge brought forward to the data analyst. The data analyst then gathers all related information to do with orders and supplies and, and when things are coming in. They take a look at all the data and immediately realize there's no way to explore all of it in the time or with the tools allotted. So you know, reflecting on the hypothesis they've been given, they whittle down that list to something that's a bit more manageable and they start their exploration of the data that's left. Now, usually a little bit of insight can be found, some small discoveries, areas to tweak. Uh, so a project is defined, that project is brought forward to stakeholders for approval. It is put into the queue to go to the data science team. And then the data science team starts to put their resources in it and come up with uh, so either some great analytics or an AI model. But what if that model is not robust enough? What if it's not tackling the right problem. What kind of risks are you introducing when you are limiting your exploration like that? Whether that data that you left out could have caused you to just refine your project a little bit more to have a bigger impact, or whether it could have changed everything you thought you knew about the problem at hand and changed how you approached it. When we allow our hypothesis to drive our exploration, limit our exploration, we are putting our projects and our business at risk. So there's a cost to leaving insight on the table. There are the missed opportunities. What could you have fixed for real that would have had a big impact because you were looking over here? What could have been an easy fix that you tried to hit with an AI hammer because you didn't know enough? And if you're fixing a small problem at the expense of a larger problem that you don't know about, you're actually not having that big of an impact on the organization. That bigger problem is gonna continue to kind of drown out any signal, any impact that you, what you're putting out is having. So it could still even be good AI. It's just not enough in the face of what's actually going on. Finally, some of that data that we're leaving out could actually be risky. It could actually be exposing us to risk. We could, again, let it, leaving a big problem untouched or not taking into account the impact of something that's really significant in our solution. Conversely, having a small data set could allow some pieces of data to really skew the AI a little bit, to have an outsized impact on our course of action and what we do. And biased AI is not good AI for a number of reasons that I think we are all very familiar with. Yeah, and thinking about this uh, limited exploration as well, um, in my career, I had an opportunity to work with uh, dozens and dozens of organizations, uh, both working with advanced data scientists and business analysts. And when you look at the tools, especially for the business analysts, right, um, they're, they're great at creating pivot tables, dashboards, Excel, SQL query. But these are great tools for maybe reporting, right? But as a way of exploring the data, I think uh, many will agree that they're a bit limited. 
right? So e even for data scientists, I feel like they're great when you can give them a target to go after, right? But um, when it comes to exploratory data analysis, uh, it's a sort of a lost art. Yeah, absolutely. So we thought it would be fun uh, to explore this concept using a data set collected by the Pew Research Center in 2021. These are the results of their social media use survey that they did. Uh, this is all the data that they collected. It includes a lot. It includes a number of different social media platforms, the frequency of visits to those platforms, your political party affiliation, your race, your education level, your employment status, your marital status, do you have a smart device? Do you have cable TV at home? Do you read? How do you read? It's a lot of information, um, which were, of course, one would hope would give us some really rich results. So these are the top two charts that the uh, Pew published alongside their article about this um, particular survey. You can see Facebook's the most widely used application followed by Snapchat. Snapchat has the biggest age spread amongst users interesting, mm -hmm. but we don't get a real sense of who these people are and how they overlap. Yeah, I think this is a great example, right, of how the data that they started with was very rich, yet um, the analysis that you're able to present here using uh, these types of, uh, let's say, pivot tables and such, right, it's very limited, right? In fact, uh, you see here uh, multiple social media engagement, but Oftentimes, there could be interactions uh, across either the different types of social media uh, and so on. So there's, um, there's limited sort of complexity or information that you can share uh, when you're using a traditional tool like this. Yeah, exactly. It's just, this is not as, as powerful um, mm -hmm. as we would have liked. So let's talk about the opportunities when we use AI-guided exploration, out-of-the-box AI-guided exploration. Uh, we call that intelligent exploration. Often when we think of AI, we think of deployed models, we think of supervised machine learning, all the end products, the downstream products, of uh, results of our exploration. But we rarely think about using them up front when we're actually mm -hmm. doing the exploration. And the, the value that it adds is, is enormous. For one thing, the AI is able to see how those uh, data elements interact with each other. It can look at a much more complexity and really see what's happening way, way more dimensionality. We can have far, far more columns of data, which of course rich, feeds that, that relationships. We see how everything plays off each other. We're not missing anything. That also gives us clarity and direction because the AI is looking at all the information and surfacing the insights, surfacing what is statistically significant and pointing our attention to that that data, it gives us clarity and direction so that we're not spinning cycles trying to dig through a whole bunch of different tables and dashboards to try to find out what's really going on. It's pointing us to what is going on so that we can really focus our efforts. And finally, where our hypothesis is, it just is biased, whether we want to admit it or not, it's based on our, our human observations, it's based on our presumptions. Um, even if we go in exploring with an open mind, we've already, as we talked about, limited what we're looking at. The AI has no such bias and the AI can look at all of it. So the AI is just looking at what's happening and what's there and bringing that forward so that we're not missing things, so that we're not giving more credence to something that doesn't really matter at the expense of something that's way more significant. Yeah, and even for advanced data scientists here, um, doing good disciplined exploratory data analysis, understanding uh, your data uh, up front before applying lots of different complex algorithms could really de-risk those projects early, right? Um, so, and then perhaps even guide the, the techniques that you might use later. So it's a great way to you know, de-risk uh, your yeah. projects. Absolutely. You know, they, my dad used to say, if you have a hammer, you think everything's a nail. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the name. If you have one way of looking at it, you tend to look at everything a certain way. Right. So let's take a look at that same data as explored with AI. Uh, and actually, I just want to mention something here. You know, if you're thinking, how hard is it to do this? Uh, all the the pieces of things exploration you're going to see uh, were run through with intelligent exploration by our summer interns. <laughs> So as a reminder, this is some of the data that was captured by the Pew survey. It's a lot. And when we look at it this like this, again, we kind of miss what that interplay is and who these people are, what is going on. Right. And this is an example how even a simple 3D visualization could really highlight uh, things that could be hidden in, in 
the visuals that you saw earlier. So what we're doing here is we simply manually created a 3D visualization uh, using the XYZ axis to represent income, age, and employment status. And what we've highlighted here, very easily see that, wait a minute, there's a, um, there's a bias here in the population. In fact, there's way more over-representation of people that are older, fully employed, as well as high income, right? So perhaps this is something that you need to be aware of when you're doing subsequent analysis like as you're doing before, right? That there is a, a bias in the population that you have selected here. Exactly. It's good for us to keep in mind as we look at everything else. Right. And this is a, um, so what you're seeing here, very interesting, is what we call, what's called a network graph, right? So a network graph, even for experienced data scientists uh, like myself, I, I wasn't, um, I haven't used much of this type of analysis uh, because of, you know, from my own experience, it's relatively new. But what's interesting in here is in the network graph, the nodes actually represent either a, a particular user or an event, a record in your database, right? Um, and then the clusters, the colors depicted by these colors represents uh, users that have similar behavior or attributes. So these are communities, right? And then the lines uh, that connect these clusters represents relationships between these clusters, right? So being, and then the distance itself captures information that says how these different communities are closer to one another versus different from one another. So this is all very complex type of relationships that's really hard to see in a traditional sort of a BI tool, but a lot of information, interesting information could be uh, understood through a representation like this. Yeah, exactly. So. These are the communities that the uh, intelligent exploration found. Uh, it identified nine distinct communities using all of that information that we showed you up front. And it, uh, we have these nine communities down the side. They're identified by their color. You'll notice the largest group is the young group, which, of course, given that they are also underrepresented in the survey sample, um, is interesting. So what that tells us is that they are still uh, quite similar to one another uh, in so much that they could be grouped together. Now, our, our interns started calling this the shark fin, and I find that's actually very helpful. So if we look at the top of the shark fin, we see three groups. We see that green group, that sort of mint green group, and they don't use the internet. That's what characterizes them. They do not use the internet, and they are very homogenous. And you can see this, um, how, how like they are by how closely they're clustered and, and the size of the nodes. Right next to them, you see the low internet group. That's that peach colored group. They're less homogenous. They're similar to the no in internet group. That's why they're up there with them, but they're less homogenous with each other. There's sort of three clusters within that group. So they're still alike enough to be in a community, but a little bit more distinct. On the other side of the green group, we have a light blue group representing our low income respondents. So they're up there with uh, the no and the low internet, probably because they don't have access to internet. They, they're actually mostly characterized by their lack of access to a smartphone, probably other means of getting on the internet. Uh, but you do see them sort of trickle down and, and start to overlap with that young group down at the bottom. Uh, probably again, not surprised that low income and young are kind of coming a little bit close together. Uh, I thought it was interesting that there are two groups uh, the golden sort of orangey yellow group at the bottom there and that purple group that are ca characterized by their use of a specific social media platform. We have uh, purple is uses next door and the yellow is uses WhatsApp. So that's what's most um, relevant to them and their use of social media platforms. Um, we also have readers. They're that green group. Again, they're not terribly homogenous. They're a little bit spread out, uh, but they are defined by their, the amount that they read. But notice that they're down there at the bottom with people using social media. So reading um, doesn't mean that you're not online. Um, and it doesn't mean they actually have very little in common with that, the, the low and no income groups up top. So I thought that was really interesting. But again, this is a much richer picture of the people who responded to this survey than what we had before. Uh, this is an example of an insight card. So we asked the AI, you know, tell us more. What's really interesting about these groups? Um, out of all that information, what do you think is most notable? So this is the insight card for that young group. Again, that's that sort of blue group down at the bottom of the shark fin. 
And you'll see what characterizes them is not just how much they use certain social media platforms, but the breadth of the social media platforms that they use. So this group is characterized by their use of Reddit. They're in the top percentile for that. TikTok, same thing. Um, they use Twitter and Instagram much more frequently than the other groups. And they're much younger. Of course, their age is in the 17th percent percentile. So that's really interesting. So we can see that they are characterized by which the number of platforms that they use, also the platforms they don't use. Notice Facebook mm -hmm. is not on here, neither is Pinterest um, or, or uh, some of the other ones. Right, and if you remember back at the previous P research analysis, right, this level of interaction across uh, this, the usage of different types of social media is really hard to demonstrate, right? But mm -hmm. here we can see how each uh, group of segment uh, interacts with one another, with the different social media, and how they're related to each other in a much easier yeah. way. Exactly. It's much more vis visibly apparent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing we did is we wanted to look at what drove use of the specific platforms individually. So for each one of the social media platforms, we asked the AI, what drives use of this platform? So this is the, the, um, the insight for use of Pinterest. And there are two insight cards. We have pinned here at the top. We have uh, the insight for the least likely to use Pinterest. Uh, that would be the blue in this particular box, least likely to use Pinterest. And to no one's surprise, they are retired married men. Um, but what did uh, honestly surprise me a little bit is the group that is most likely to use Pinterest. That's the second insight. And mm -hmm. they are characterized by red are married women. And it's not that the married women, it's the fact that they worked full time. I'd always thought of Pinterest as a leisure tool mm -hmm. for someone with a lot of time on their hands. So I was a little bit surprised to see women who work full time um, being the biggest user, user group. Right. And something to note here, I think it might be easy to miss, especially the part of the graph that we're highlighting here. What's, the, uh, what's interesting about this is that those areas were actually discovered by the AI. So the AI looked at the, uh, the 3D graph and highlighted those areas because they're interesting from a standpoint that they're different from the rest of the group. So it automatically selected, hey, look here, and because these two groups are different, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's the power of AI-guided visualization. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you notice the biggest box on this screen um, showing non-users is men who work full time. Mm -hmm. But when you look at as a group and likelihood, it's actually the retired men who are least likely to use it, not married men. Right. Yeah. So that brings us to the last piece, which is how do we see the results of these these uh, insights? Right. So uh, hopefully uh, by now, um, this is evident, the fact that complex data sets are best understood, at least starting with 3D visuals and the interactive capability, right? In fact, um, our own, so research has shown that if you are able to combine these types of techniques, visualization techniques, interaction techniques in your analysis, uh, there's a 23% boost in, in and cognitive boost in under helping the user analysts understand the relationship and complexity that's in your data, right? The second benefit here is that, next slide, uh, mm -hmm. that, that as you saw, sometimes the interactions across the various attributes are much easier to see when you could visualize it, with, when you can interact with the data in a 3D way, right? And then lastly, um, a lot of times when you visualize multi-dimensional data in 2D format, there's an, what's called occlusion, meaning things are not hard to, certain relationships are hard to see, they're hidden behind other things. So being able to represent that and analyze in a 3D way, rotate, really helps uh, to uncover relationships like that. And really for me, one of the biggest reasons uh, that I love this is because it's fun. Right? It's fun to interact with data in a visual way like this. And uh, I think um, it also is very engaging when you are ready to present your analysis to the audience. Yeah. And that, you know what, that's not just a nice to have. You need people mm -hmm. to pay attention to what you're doing um, to get that proper informed buy-in that sets the stage for success for everything you do. Right. So where can you go when you start using intelligent exploration uh, on your projects, when you are building on a solid foundation? 
the sky's the limit, really. When you start there, you are focusing on the right problem. You are taking the right approach to fixing it. You are having a massive impact on your organization. So let's think about that example I talked about earlier of the, the supply chain problem. Supplies are arriving later than usual. And that's it. That's all you have to do. You don't have to wonder why. You just say, this is, this is the problem we'd like to tackle. Let's explore it. So your business analyst takes all that data and instead of going, oh my goodness, how am I going to look at it all? Feeds it into uh, the, the AI to take a look at, to do some intelligent exploration. The, intel the intelligent exploration goes through, it finds the relationships, it finds the insights, it points out those things that really matter. Mm -hmm. And maybe in this case, it discovers it's not really a supply chain side. In fact, two of the three factors that are most impactful uh, are on the inventory management side. And that changes everything, whether you just, you can solve this problem with an AI model. Uh, and if you do choose to go that route, you have that information, you know the factors that are relevant, the viable factors to take forward, but maybe it points to a different solution, whether it's uh, a different analytic report, whether it is a change in the, the system, whether it's simply a process change. You said sometimes the best AI is no AI at all. Mm -hmm. Either way, you know you're aiming in the right direction and are going to have the right impact. So your business analyst is able to look at things, look at everything, build that solid foundation. You're defining the project that you really, really need. You get informed buy-in from your stakeholders. They know what they're buying into, that you have their backing. They know you've taken everything into account and you're able to create an impactful, transparent AI initiative built on a foundation of the whole truth and really drive change across your organization. So if you thought what you looked at today was cool, Gartner agrees with you and they named us as a cool vendor for analytics and data science for 2022. That report is available for you to download on our website, virtualytics.com, and we encourage you to do so. Thank you so much.